Buenos días. Yeah. So the three basic elements of a free city are economics, ethics, and governance. The fundamental economic proposition about free cities that we need to understand is that population density and public goods generate land rent. The fundamental ethical proposition about freedom that we need to understand is that there exists a universal ethic as the expression of natural moral law, which tells us the meaning not just of liberty, but also defines the concept of the market. The fundamental political proposition about governance that we need to understand is that liberty is best secured by dividing governance into small neighborhood cells and then structuring the voting bottom up. One of the conference questions is, what principles define a free city? The ethical principle is natural moral law, which defines a free society in general. As John Locke an analyzed it, the moral law of nature derives from two observations about human nature. One, our mental and bodily in independence, and secondly, the equality of our pensions, the capacity and use of reason, awareness, purpose, choice, and judgment of consequences. Given the criteria of natural moral law having to be comprehensive, universal, and non-arbitrary, from these premises, one can derive a universal ethic as the expression of natural law. So the universal ethic has three basic rules. One, evil is coercive harm to others. Two, moral good is a welcome benefit. And three, all other acts are morally neutral. Harm is an invasion into another's domain and is distinct from mere offense, which is disagreeable only due to the beliefs and values of the recipient. The universal ethic gives us the meaning of voluntary action. An act is voluntary if it is either good or neutral by the rules of the universal ethic. The universal ethic also provides the content for natural rights. One has the natural right to do anything that does not coercively harm others. And one has the natural right to be free from the coercive harm of others. The laws of a free city should be in accord with natural moral law. The principles that define a free city must also include the constitution of governance. The Constitution, of course, is the highest law. Thus, the Constitution of a free city should explicitly recognize the primacy of natural rights. And the Constitution is also the foundation for the structure of governance. An important concept of governance is the recognition of two levels of rules, the constitutional and the operational. The constitutional level of choice occurs when one joins a group or enters into a contract. Your decision to take part in this conference was a constitutional choice. A voluntary marriage is a constitutional choice. The voluntariness of a free city is primarily at the constitutional level of choosing to join it. Merely moving in to a, to a city does not constitute a real agreement. How can I agree if I don't agree that I agree? Now, the governing principle of a free city is contract. To be truly voluntary, the free city needs to have a written constitution, an explicit agreement among legal equals that members read, understand, and sign. A completely free city would not only be voluntary at the constitutional level of joining, but also at the operational level of living, so that only course of harm to others, force and fraud, would be prohibited, all other acts, no matter how offensive to some, would be permitted. The completely free city would have no zoning or other restrictions on the use of one's property, so long as negatives such as pollution are compensated. Instead of zoning, which can be rigid and subject to political pressures, there should be contracts such as covenants, easements, and liens. 
as I said, the governing principle of a free city is contract. And in general, decentralized contracting works better than centrally planned contracts because decentralized contracts utilize the local knowledge that the economist Hayek emphasized. The heart of a community contract is its public finance, the revenues and the spending. And the fundamental concept of the city, the fundamental economic concept of the city is land rent. The three economic elements of a city are people, capital goods, and space. The city has a high population density that creates a demand to use its scarce space. The economic term for the three-dimensional space is land, and its yield is rent. The city governance and enterprise provides collective goods, which are tangible capital goods, and also services and intangible benefits that people use at the same time without reducing the amount for others. For example, the fixtures in this room, the lighting and so forth, are collective because we're all using the same uh, services of the light, and one person's use does not diminish the use by others. The collective goods of a hotel, for example, include the public transit, the elevators and escalators, the hallways, the public park in the lobby, the administration, fire protection, security, and possibly recreational facilities. You don't pay for these separately, usually. They are included in the room charge. The marginal cost of providing these collective goods to one more user is about zero. And that's what the hotel charges. Because these benefits make the room more valuable, these collective goods generate a higher market rental. The public finance of an efficient free city operates the same way. If you examine how hotels, shopping centers, office buildings, industrial estates, marinas, condominiums, housing co-ops, and homeowners associations operate, they have assessments or dues that in economic effect, collect the rentals generated by their collective goods. But today's governments don't operate that way. The city governments and other governments impose taxes on labor, goods, and enterprise profits, and usually only collect a small portion of the rentals generated by their uh, public goods. A worker tenant pays twice, once in higher rental, and again in taxes, while the landowner gets an implicit subsidy of greater rental and land value, and this is due to literally rent-seeking by the landed interests. But an efficient free city has neither subsidies, nor taxes, nor arbitrary restrictions. Of course, a voluntary city contract could involve a tax on income, sales, and enterprise, but that would create a needless deadweight loss. One of our questions was, what is our vision of a free city and what strategy would best advance that vision? We want our free cities to promote enterprise, have full employment, and be prosperous. The public revenue that fits these goals is what private communities are already doing, collecting the rentals generated by their works and services with no levy on personal property, wages, entrepreneurial profits, and goods. The community collection of site rent maximizes both prosperity and liberty. There is harmony between what maximizes efficiency and what maximizes liberty. The rental also measures the efficient amount of collective goods. If a service such as public transit generates more rental than cost, it's worth doing. And the efficient amount is the quantity for which the extra cost equals the extra revenue, as standard economics says. Another of the questions is, what governance systems does a free city need? Of course, at the constitutional level, people can have whatever system they agree to. But as free cities are in competition with one another and with non-free communities, the relevant question is, what is the optimal governing system, one which maximizes peace and harmony? A free city could be completely proprietary, that is, owned by a corporation, like the old company towns in the USA, 
and a seasteading city that would be owned by a corporation. But many people want a greater voice in community affairs. So there would be communities of co-owners and tenants, like community associations today. But a free city should not copy the dysfunctional political system of today's governments. Today's countries and cities practice a deadly system, mass democracy. When thousands or millions of people vote for politicians, the candidates must use the mass media, creating a demand for campaign funds, which is supplied by powerful special interests in exchange for privileges, subsidies, and protection from competition at the expense of consumers and taxpayers. And this results in punitive taxation, restrictions, and injustice. The free city can avoid this with radically decentralized democracy. Divide the governing body into tiny neighborhood cells, many of which would already be organized as condominiums, cooperatives, homeowners associations, and commercial ownership. Each cell elects a neighborhood council, and groups then elect higher level councils, and so on to the highest level, the city council. So with this bottom-up, multi-level structure, all voting is done in a small group, eliminating the demand by candidates for large campaign funds. The free city could also have another method of decision-making, which is called demand revelation. Suppose some residents want the city to have a big festival of freedom. The city council seeks to do a cost-benefit analysis. But how can they measure the subjective value of the festival? The answer is demand revelation. Everybody is told their share of the cost for the collective good. Then you have each resident uh, declare the most they would pay to have that collective good. If the total benefit is greater than the total cost, then you do it. But to keep people honest, have each resident uh, whose stated value change the outcome relative to having stated one's cost, compensate everybody else equal to their, the net total loss of everybody else. And that keeps everybody honest. So if you change the outcome, you compensate for doing that. The total value would then be collect, uh, compared to the total cost, and if the value is higher than the prescribed cost, then you do it. There would be one more source of public revenue in a free city, pollution and congestion charges. Today's unfree cities are choking with congestion, and many have unhealthy air and water. These problems are due to mispricing. To be efficient, the city has to avoid subsidies. And in effect, today, a polluter is subsidized if he can shift the cost to others. The free city would levy a charge for pollution and congestion as compensation for causing these negative effects. The congestion charge would best be paid electronically as a car drives by. The same principle would have been, uh, could be applied to parking. Have meters that vary by time of day with no time limits, charge electronically to the owner's account, one should be able to park anywhere within a block of one's destination. Thus, the efficient, free, the efficient public finance of a free city, which provides the optimal amount of collective goods, is a combination of rental payments, payments from demand revelation, and payments to prevent negative externalities. Now, one way to transform cities towards greater freedom is with service substitution. Replace a government service such as education or street maintenance or garbage collection with private contractual service. And then deduct the expenses the city saves from the tax liabilities of the residents. In my judgment, the replacement of city government with civic associations should be entirely voluntary. Forced secession from city government services destroys the voluntary nature of civic the civic associations of a free city. No person or property owner should be forced to join a contractual organization because then it's not a true contract. 
So to summarize, these principles of a free city for economics, ethics, and governance are complementary and in harmony. Together, these three principles create a grand unified field theory of the free city.